Welcome to another Wagon Wheel on Spotify Green Room. Uh, thanks again to all the Patreon people who have helped support us. I should say that I, for some reason, forgot to ask for any Patreon questions this week. So I'm sure there's some great, incredible Patreon questions out there, just unasked. So uh, again, thank you to everyone on Patreon um, and uh, my fault there for forgetting to put out the question. Um, but I have, uh, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of stuff to talk about even without the Patreon. Big thanks to manscaped.com. Um, if you want your balls trimmed in a safer way, you know, without cuts and nicks, so to speak, uh, head over to manscaped.com, uh, buy their lawnmower 4.0, put in Red Inca, the uh, name of this podcast, into the, uh, into the box and you will get a 20% uh, discount and free worldwide shipping. Uh, and thanks to Bodyline T-shirts. Uh, got rocking a bit of a curtly t-shirt today. So uh, thank you very much. Um, but with no Patreon questions, let's just get right into the, uh, into the green room questions. Let's see who we have first. Googlies, quarter seamer, Karen, Dukes, back of the hand, red, leg cutters, Tisra, pink, knuckle, white, slider, seed, heavy, bounces, cherry, length, pill, off cutters, old, crimson traveler, kookaburra, hard, Outswing, second new, off spin, arm, SG, split finger, shiny, leg spin, soft, new, Yorkers, flippers, wrong ends, long hops, reverse swing, half volley, and third new. These are just some of the names we use for balls in cricket. Well, Manscaped wants you to be as proud of your balls as you are of the ones delivered by your favorite cricketer. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. 20% off and free worldwide shipping. Insert the code REDINCA at manscaped.com. I've actually used this, um, not just something that I'm hawking for fun. And I got to admit, I thought it was a bit silly. And then I went down there and it was exceptional. I honestly feel I could bowl outswing with one nut and inswing with the other. So get 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code REDINCA at manscaped.com. Manscaped, for the man who cares about his balls as much as the ones out in the middle. Buska. Hey, Jared. <laughs> How you doing? What's your question? Yeah, so Jared, I've been uh, following the 100 and uh, now the IPL or the Inch 20 League in uh, UAE. And what I've noticed is that... Uh, 65 to 70 percent of the matches are being won by the team cheesing and that in a way what is a pattern which has been very evident that after five or six overs when the power plays off the batting team actually kind of slows down and that comes in effect their overall rate in that way so if my a couple of questions one question is do you think that batting second is a distinct advantage especially in a shorter form of game uh, short, short of our cricket, obviously, 100 and T20s. And secondly, well, uh, uh, how can batting teams uh, 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 cope with that, given that uh, there's always the question of what is a power score and uh, overcome this challenge? Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, it's been going on for a long time in, in T20 cricket. Um, I don't know when teams first cottoned on to it, but what are we, 2021? So it must have been around 2015, 2016 when, um, when it all started. Uh, and no one's really done anything to, you know, fix it. <laughs> so so teams keep winning the toss and fielding. And it's kind of ridiculous at a certain point because teams are just winning the toss and fielding. I don't know. At one stage, it was over 80% of the time, I think. And there have been really key teams who haven't done it, who've been successful with it. Uh, I think off the top of my head, maybe Adelaide Strikers, um, uh, Hyderabad was probably another one. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Uh, but maybe a couple of other teams out there who went the other way. But in order to do that, you kind of either needed Rashid Khan or you needed a different kind of team setup. And most teams just don't have that. Most teams are very standard setup. So uh, it's been a problem for a long time. No one involved in T20 cricket seems to be that interested in it, really. Um, uh, yeah, I think from a psychological point, it's very hard to work out if you're batting first how hard you need to go. I know I remember talking to the West Indian guys specifically. They really like chasing... Uh, because they felt that they could score at 10 runs and over without, the, like, if the, even if they failed, if the chase got to 10 runs and over, everyone would be like, well, that's kind of fair enough. Like, that's a hard chase. Whereas if you're scoring at 10 runs and over in the first innings, everyone's like, ah, oh, Cruz, wicked away. So 
there's a there, there is a psychological thing to the way that players are blamed and everything involving it. But yeah, I mean, what you've said is true. It's there's a problem within the the, the fabric of the game, and like sadly, many things in T20 cricket, just no one's really in charge, and no one's thought of a way to fix it. Um, and so it continues at this point um, and will for quite some time. So I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I'm sure there's some very good mathematicians or um, analysts out there who've thought about it more than I have. I just think you should pick Rashid Khan in your team and then, you, then you'd be better off. <laughs> yeah, and Adelaide's checkers and uh, uh, Sunrise both have him. So I think that's yeah, the I mean, option. They're the two teams I remember doing it the most. I'm sure there's been other teams that either in smaller leagues that have tried it as well. But if you're a bowling-heavy team, um, it kind of makes sense to bat first, I think, in, in certain situations. Like, you know, if you've got a safe batting lineup, and which the Strikers and the Sunrises uh, both did, you know, you get to a certain total and then you defend it. And I'm sure there are other teams who have tried similar things to that as well. But as a general rule, you want your batters to know what they're doing. Um, and that's why uh, it's so much better uh, to bat in the second innings. But thanks so much for your question. Basil. Yeah, hi there. Ooh, Basil. How you doing? Yeah, doing well. Okay, uh, I had like three questions planned for you. I will just ask one. You can ask three because at the moment, no one else has put their hands up. So you might, all they have, and it's getting glitchy again. So uh, uh, um, you can ask a couple. <laughs> okay, then uh, first question, pretty simple. Uh, do you think there is a team good enough to beat Australia next year in the World Cup? Women's World Cup. No. Yes, I think there are other teams that could beat Australia. Um, I mean, Australia lost the 2017 World Cup and they were the best team in that tournament. Uh, you know, they have, you know, they have, they've lost a game to India recently, obviously, as well. Um, so, yes, I think it's possible. No, 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 of course. I mean, look, they're favourites. But if you ask me if it's possible that they lose, yes. Uh, do they go in as, what, 60 or 70% chance of winning the tournament? Probably, which is, I don't think any men's team has probably gone in with that high a ratio uh, before a tournament. So that's huge to begin with. But it's a knockout game, isn't it? So when it comes down to it, it's, you know, if it's a one-off knockout game, then realistically, we just talked about the toss. The toss can play a part. The condition can play a part. And injury can play a part. You know, all those things can happen. So do I think that the other teams are close enough that, you know, two injuries happen. Um, I mean, you look at what happened to Rajasthan in, in, in this, in the IPL, you know, if you have a situation where two or three of the top um, uh, Australian players are not available, then yeah, I think there's a very good chance of the, um, of, a, of another team beating them. Yeah. Um, right. but, but, yeah. Well, but in case. Oh, sorry. I missed that. What was that? Yeah. What happened to Rajasthan was an extreme case, you know, like oh, they yeah, built yeah, a team. Yeah. Around those three players, and all three of them. Were no, of course, it. of course, but but that happens. Do you know what I mean? Like, so in Rajasthan's case, it, you know, so so I've just done a video up on on YouTube about Rajasthan, and you know, well, I think we have to be honest and say that they had not been building their side correctly. I think that's very fair, um, and there's no way that you can ignore that. But you also have to say what would have happened to another really good team if you took out their three, uh, you know, three of their five best um, overseas options. And I don't think anyone would do well there. And I think it's exactly the same with, you know, if uh, 2003 World Cup, um, Gillespie was a good player, but I don't think he was anyone's idea of an ideal ODI player, um, a perfect ODI player. And Shane Warne didn't play. Australia still went on to win that World Cup. But what if it was Shane Warne, Glenn McGrath, and I don't know, Matthew Hayden? Do they still go on to win that World Cup? Uh, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, we... We don't know. And I, I suppose things like that can happen in the women's game as well. But I don't know if any team's going to go. In, in the T20, I think Australia is probably slightly more susceptible just because it's harder to keep a really high win percentage up um, in, in T20. Whereas in one day cricket, you know, you have the ability, you know, to, you know, I think was it England's win percentage was 71% between the two World Cups um, and went on to win the World Cup, you know, uh, Australia's been even better, the women's team. So, uh, yeah, I think with all that in mind, it's certainly uh, it's certainly unlikely. But, yes, I do think there's – Yeah, I don't think that 
they the injuries won't affect them. I don't think that the you know I think there certain pitches might might trip them up. Uh, you know certain conditions. You know and and Harmon Preet showed in 2017. You know one freak innings uh, can make a huge difference as well. So um, all those things can happen. Uh, I think they're a better team than they were in 2017. I think they learned a lot of very good lessons um, in in that tournament. Uh, I don't think they prepared for it perfectly. And I think they thought that they were just going to turn up and win. Um, I think now they fight a little bit hard for each individual game, um, and, and so I think they're and I think they're a better team as well. I think their players have developed a lot in that in that four years. So um, no, it's a really good question, Basil. Thank you very much. Can I ask another? Oh yeah, sorry. Go slip one more in. Okay, uh, like, do you think in uh, in the future these T Twenty mercenary players, especially the ones from uh, West Indies? Will employ their own uh, personal analyst to look at their game and uh, uh, also the their the players they play against, things like that. Do you see that happen? Yeah, that really happens. It already happens. Yeah, yeah, I've done it for players before, and not just not just West Indian players, and not just T20 mercenaries, as you put it. Um, yeah, I've done it for. I mean, I've done it for Shan Masood. Um, I've done it for you know many other players have contacted me over the time. Uh, West Indians, Australians, I'm trying to think anyone else. If I had a South African, maybe not. Um, English, um, Scottish, uh, you know, players contact me sometimes and, and, and do that. And if they're doing it with me, I don't think I'm the only one. Um, uh, But that's like a, like a one-off thing, right? Do you do do any of your players employ that? No, 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 they're players. No, there are players that that, that that pay people. I I usually don't take money off the players. Um, I mean, if Chris Gale or uh, Barrett Coley came to me, I probably would. Um, Sean Masood was kind of me testing to see how it worked with the player individually. Um, you know, I've had I've had IPL players um, get in touch. Uh, realistically, I tell them the same thing. Like, you know, if they, if if it's not me, if they want an analyst, they need to invest in it. Um, I know of people who've worked, uh, players who have paid analysts uh, before. Um, there are some people who work through agents as well, which I've done as well as an analyst. Uh, you know, an agent might say to you, uh, uh, "This guy's having trouble with this. Can we bring you in?" Um, uh, you know, because obviously it's the agency's uh, job also to get them ticking. So, no, it definitely happens. Um, Uh, I'm trying to think of. I don't know of any big name players, but I know of smaller players who've certainly paid for um, information before tournaments with analysts. I know for players who might have had a tricky year coming up, who have um, talked to analysts uh, and you know had given analysts money to be available to them. Uh, you know, you've got you've got batting coaches, um, physios, fitness people, analysts. Bowling coaches, I suppose, although it's not as common, but there's a few as well. Um, that a lot of players now on the circuit um, kind of pick one or two of those players. Our oh, mental mental health is the other one as well. As well. Um, psychologists and things like that. So you know, uh, when Chris Gale sort of had his renaissance um, in his late thirties, that was based on I think two professionals. I think it was two. Um, he got a, a physio, and I, I think this is right, a physio and a fitness advisor that uh, they didn't travel with him all the time, although they did travel on certain occasions just because they knew exactly what he needed um, and he had the money. I think Carlos Brathwaite might have got a fitness or might have been a physio as well um, to travel with them. I don't think you probably need an analyst to travel with you. A lot of players have psychologists um, uh, that they work with, um, like, on uh, again. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's getting more and more. So, yeah, there's certainly um, analysts who've been paid to work with players directly and, Uh, we'll probably see more of that going forward. I think I think that's fair. Um, you see that in other sports as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers, man. Uh, oh. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Sorry. I will remove you. There we go. All right. All right. VJ. VJ. Hey, Jared. How are you? Very good. What's your question? My question is around strike zone for batters, right? And I'm asking you this because I've been watching a few IPL games where batsmen are standing on off stump before the ball has been bowled, and yeah. Bravo would bowl it an inch outside the tram line on the offside. The ball goes over the batsman's bat, and it's called a wide, right? And he's about you know six inches off his next stump guard, and, and that's a wide these days. Um, 
why is it that bowlers can use the crease when they're bowling from, from end to end? But on the batsman side, mm -hmm. they can use the crease. They can make room on the leg side. They can make room, go all the way to the off side. They can use the entire width, basically, from off side to leg side tram lines. And before the ball's bowled, after the ball's bowled. But the ball itself seems to be only bowled in this diminishing strike zone like baseball, where the batsman can play. And if it's a little bit outside of that, it's a wide. Why can't, do you believe we should go well, I think more like bowlers can bowl anywhere? between the tram lines because batsmen can move anywhere on these tram lines and the batsman can then reverse hit it if it's down the leg side. They can cross bat it on the off side. They can play baseball shots around left, right, whatever. Or do you think we limit it like just the way it is right now and then if it could outside the reach of the bat is a wife, basically, or down the leg side. Yeah, so I, I, I think... Yeah, I think the, the first thing is to say that when batters move outside our stump, quite often the umpires don't give a wide when the ball's just outside the tram lines. I don't know if you've noticed, but that's actually happened quite a bit in this IPL where umpires have said, no, no, you moved. No, 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 I know. But let, let's start with that. So we are actually more flexible now when a batter moves around with wides than we used to be because we never used to be that flexible. <laughs> it's like a batter could stand anywhere and it was like a millimeter out and it would be a wide. The other one, the other thing you said was, I don't know if you're very aware with of 1950s cricket, but if if you open up bowlers to bowl outside leg stump, they will do it over and over again, uh, especially off spinners, maybe in swing bowlers, and it would be the worst form of cricket you will ever see. There is no way at 80 miles an hour you can reverse hit someone who's bowling two foot outside leg stump. Right, you'd have to be ready for it beforehand. Um, it would completely change the game of cricket to be able to do that. The, the, uh, I think we've probably been a bit too stringent with leg side wides at times because we want, we want the stumps to be in play. We want more bowls really as much as anything. Um, and so you, you have to allow for the fact that the bowl is going to miss leg stump by a couple of inches. Um, and I think, again, we've got slightly better at that um, in the last couple of years of, of limited overs cricket. But you can't have a situation where the bowlers can bowl um, on either side of the tram lines because it would – change the way that batters are batting and at 80, 85, 90 miles an hour, there's nothing you can do. Um, and even for off spin, it would just make off spin dire to watch. Um, it's not, you know, it would completely change what batting is. I'm, I don't really see that as an advantage for the game at all. That makes sense. Can I ask you another quick question then? Um, bowlers, bowlers going behind the crease. I'm talking behind the stumps on the bowlers end. I know Bravo does it a, a little bit. Um, but I saw uh, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar tried in a game and the umpire basically said, you have to bowl in front of me. Like, I have to be able to see you re release the ball. Is that something you think is underused these days? And what's the actual law on that? Like, wh what's the limit to where your crop foot can be? Can you be like a foot next to the umpire and release the balls? I think you have to be in front of the umpire, but it's also you can move the umpire. So you can actually ask the umpire to stand back. They might not, but you can actually do that. Uh I don't know what its effectiveness is. I will tell you a very, very funny story from club cricket once uh, where we played on, uh, on, on a ground and the opposition couldn't hit us. And I don't know what they made. They probably batted for 80 overs, made 180. And I bowled, I think my first 10 overs went for 12 runs. Um, and I would bowl a leg spinner and the guy would come down to hit me and then he would stop and go back into his crease and he'd like be beaten twice. And I was like, like, I know I'm not a quick leg spinner, but this seems ridiculous. And they couldn't hit me. No one could get down to the pitch. We had an off spinner at the other end. Exactly the same um, thing was happening, but even our medium paces and everything. And it turned out that what had happened was instead of measuring the pitch, the person had gone out to, to do the crease had just based it on where the old crease lines were. And I don't know if you know, but, you know, grass swells and moves. And so we ended up playing on a pitch that was an extra, I think, two meters long. It might have even been longer than that. It might have even been three meters long. And um, no one could get their timing. And that's, and that's all it was. So based on that, I have always thought that the Kyron Pollard, I'm trying to think of some other bowlers have done it as well, but Pollard's kind of the king Trinal of this. Pandya does it. All the Mumbai boys do it a bit. Yeah. And, and then that's, I think that's just uh, uh, Pollard doing it. But there's some, there was someone before Pollard who did it as well. Um, it's certainly something that you see um, on occasion. Uh, I would think it would mess with your timing, right? And I think if, if, we talk about if we talk about the back of the hand slower balls, and um, back of the hand slower balls are the most sort of misdiagnosed cricket balls ever. People will talk about whether you can pick them or not. 
I can pick a back of the hand slower ball. So I'd be shocked if any professional cricketer can't pick the fact that the ball's coming out the other side of the hand. It looks completely different, right? But yet people still have trouble with them, especially when they're bowled well. Part of that is the revolutions on the ball, but part of it is you just have, they're so slow that you have to hold your shape longer, right? And that is what knuckleballs do as well. And my guess is if you're bowling from two meters back, that would be another thing that you're doing. You, uh, if you're a batter, even if you pick it up, you have to hold your shape just that long, little bit longer. So I would think that it would work more as a tactic, um, but I, I suppose until we analyze it better, where bowlers are actually w releasing the ball from, like we've only just got to the point where we work out that Jasper Boomer is bowling 50 centimeters closer than a standard bowler, right? And that is a huge advantage for him because he has this incredible release point that's so far forward. So. The fact that we've only just got there, I don't even know if uh, Hawkeye Data tells us perfectly where the ball is being released from back um, in those situations. But yeah, it's it's something I've talked about with a couple of bowlers before. A lot of them just don't feel comfortable because I don't I don't know if you've ever tried it. It's kind of like as you're running up to the crease, your body sort of takes over and takes you where you want. And so the actual going going wide of the crease or going close to the stumps is a kind of an easy thing to do. Uh, but bowling back from the crease is really hard because your body almost like muscle memory gets you as close to the crease as possible every time, um, and which is why you see, you know, bowlers with shuffle steps and all those sorts of things sometimes when they lose their run-up because that's their body correcting to get to the right place. So I don't know if it's something you'd have to practice, but I would assume that in a game where timing is so important, uh, that bowling just back from the crease would be very, uh, very good. It'd be great maybe to go through, you know, if you're a hardcore analyst, you could maybe go through all of Kyron Pollard's. I mean, he's the one most likely, as you said, Dwayne Bravo does it as well, Krunal Pandya. But go through all of Kyron Pollard's times that he's done it to see what his run rate is in those balls compared to others. Um, I think that would be really interesting. But uh, uh, thank you very much for your questions. Thanks, Aaron. Oh, yeah. Oh. No, all right. Okay, here we go next. Jocks. Jocks, you there? Hello, Jocks? Hey, do yeah, yeah, you want to question? Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, so my question was about so my question was about wicket keeping in T twenty. So I've read a hundred articles over the last ten years or so, which have talked about how T twenty is gonna be the rebirth of the specialist wicket keeper, but I've not you know, really seen that happening in, in T20 leagues or in, in uh, international T20. So I was wondering if you, if you kind of had any thoughts about why. Have you read my piece? <laughs> I have read your piece, but not for a while, I'm afraid. No, no, that's all right. So essentially, we don't have any metrics that really tell us if someone is a good wicketkeeper or not. And T20 is get largely a metrics-based sport. You know, we, we don't really, you know, players are still not, other than, you know, obvious guys like Fabian Allen and Hayden Walsh, players are still not really picked on their fielding, right? Even though we know that there are plus fielders and there are negative fielders and there are par fielders. So wicket keeping is in a similar basket to that. How can you tell me that someone is good? Uh, you know, I remember a situation a few years ago with a, with a cricket team and they were, playing in Asia. Yeah, they must have been playing in Asia. And they had to pick between two different wicket keepers. They knew one was a slightly better batter and they knew one was a slightly better wicket keeper. They were playing in Asia. They thought the ball was going to spin a lot. They had a couple of spinners that they really liked. And so they went with their specialist wicket keeper and he missed, I don't know, two or three stumpings in the first three or four games. Um, and realistically, I, remember, I, they, I must have been talking to someone from the team because they were asking me about it and I said, what percentage of the of of stumpings do you think are missed? How many did he take? How many did he take in over the last ten years? Uh, you know, two years or whatever it was he'd been playing for them. And because about I think it's thirty two percent of stumpings are missed. Uh, and so he might have missed two, but he might have got his previous seven or eight. <laughs> and we're not counting that, and we're not keeping that. That is, I think, the biggest thing. I I, I think I worked this out for someone I worked for that wicket keepers touch the ball about between, well, it depends on, on, the, on the kind of um, wicket, but I, I touch the ball between 15 and 22 times uh, when a bowler bowls to them. But if you also factor in the amount of times they touch it from throws coming in, 
it's a huge amount of touches that a wicketkeeper has in a game. Now, how many mistakes swing that in either direction? And, you know, what's the difference between a wicketkeeper who can average 30 with a strike rate of 130 and can average 20 with a strike rate of 140? Like, we're not even answering all those questions yet. Where do these players fit in? Uh, there's also the one thing I would say that probably isn't mentioned enough is that in the 80s when Jack Russell, uh, well, in the 90s and early 2000s when Jack Russell was up at the stumps for Gloucestershire, for instance, and they had all those guys bowling around 80 miles an hour and he could wicket keep up to the stumps against. There aren't many of those guys left of that pace. Uh, if you're going to go up to the stumps now, you're going to do it. I, who did it the other day? Uh, Dhoni did it for Bravo. Um, at the end of the Chennai game. And Bravo looked he, Bravo looked like his options were taken away because I think Bravo was thinking, I can't bowl. They, they're not going to expect the, the bouncer now. Um, and he was probably thinking, I can't bowl. I can't go too straight. Um, uh, you know, I have to give Dhoni a bit of a side to here. And Bravo is the sort of, you know, Bravo, I suppose to most people, we would consider to be the sort of Ian Harvey type bowler, but he's actually probably five, six, seven Ks quicker than Ian Harvey, maybe consistently, maybe even slightly quicker than that. Um, and so there are fewer bowlers that you can come up to the stumps with as medium paces now, which I do think makes a big difference. But if you're investing in all the best spinners in the world, in your team, uh, and your wicketkeeper is not top quality, it, it, you know, it's a bit like, well, is it in American football? They talk about, obviously, you spend the most money on the quarterback, but then you should spend the second most money on the guys who defend the quarterback. And I kind of think that sometimes you see these big sums of money go for spinners uh, or, or a team is based around spin. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, someone like KL Raul, I mean, he's just not good up at the stumps. And he's never going to be. He's obviously a natural athlete, but he's never going to be consistently good up at, up at the stumps. Um, and that means any spinner that, that he's bowling to is, I don't know, uh, less important, is, you know, uh, uh, less active. And, you know, but you talk to bowlers around the world. I mean, cricket is a batter-led batter game that coaches end up being batters and the administrators end up being batters and, you know, every, almost everyone's a batter one way or another. Um, and the bowlers are like, it's hard enough to make, you know, 24 chances or 26 chances happen in a test match. Do we? If we've got a guy who makes us make 27 or 28, um, that's that's hard. And that is probably where we will get to wicket-keeping. But I think that the biggest change will be someone like Michael Bates will come through eventually, probably from Asia, who will be so good at wicket keeping that uh, there will be a revolution. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at, you know, Taylor, Barry, um, Russell, all of those guys were, could overcome their batting because of the ability they had with the gloves. Like Darren Barry allowed you to have your slip, you know, uh, two metres wider just because of the ground that he could cover. And he could, he could keep up the stumps to people who bowled 85 miles an hour again, um, which is not a normal thing. You know, a, a Jack Russell's ability to keep up the stumps uh, to, you know, a, a lot of different bowlers, but also not miss any chances when standing back. Again, um, uh, you know, gives you uh, those two things. And Jack Russell is taking catches and getting stumpings um, that other wicket keepers are not. If we get to the point where we have wicket keepers like that again, uh, it's possible, but I wouldn't hold my breath. And the reason I wouldn't hold my breath is at junior level, I don't know how these guys would come through anymore. Um, the amount of wicket keepers I talked to for my piece, I said, how did you start wicket keeping? And I said, well, I was a batter and I got picked for a um, representative side and someone said, who wants to pick up the gloves? I didn't pick the wicket keeper. Um, that's, where, that's where junior cricket is at, at the moment. No one is picking specialist wicket keepers. And if that's the case in junior cricket, why would it be any different at, at the professional level? You're really hoping that there's a freak who had never picked up the gloves before 15 or 16 who suddenly gets good at it. Um, and I don't think that is going to provide us many Russells, Taylors, Prasanna J. Awardners, um, even, even someone like Dhoni, who's, you know, incredible up at the stumps, but was limited behind. You know, I don't think we see many... Uh, Prasanna J. Wardner is maybe the last great up at the stumps and, and back wicket keeper in international cricket. Um, I wonder how many we'll see going forward. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks. All right. Keshav.
Yusuf? Hi, can you hear me? I can. What's your question? Hi, I hope you remember me uh, from the YouTube collaboration. Uh, good to be talking to you again. Oh, how are you doing? I, I didn't notice you, although now I'm having a look at your very dramatic um, photo and I, I can remember you. Uh, what's your question, mate? Yeah, so uh, my question is actually uh, about MS Dhoni and, you know, his uh, uh, S match uh, performances as a captain. So, you know, how people often talk about he was not a great test captain because of those 4 0 drubbings in 2011 in England and Australia. And at the same time, people rave about, you know, Virat Kohli winning in those countries. But, you know, uh, Amazon also won in New Zealand and drew a series in South Africa, which Virat hasn't really been able to do in those countries. So is it more rewarding to win in England and Australia as test captains? Or, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I just wanted to ask you what what's your thoughts on Dhoni's test captaincy and why people do not talk more about, you know, his wins in uh, New Zealand or maybe a draw series in South Africa? I think it's important to note, though, that it, a lot of it is to do with the 4 0. That was a long, drawn out big series, right? So everyone is going to notice the droppings uh, in a way that doesn't happen in, you know, a, a normal shorter series against. If you lose a series against South Africa or New Zealand, uh, it's not as high profile around the world and they're shorter. Probably going to be three test series more often, aren't they? Maybe even a two test series. Those things actually matter. Um, the other thing is, and you know, I've written this big piece about Owen Morgan recently. I did a video on it on YouTube as well, I think. Um, uh, if you win, you're a good captain, and if you lose, you're not. That's how people look at this. It's a nonsensical way of doing it. If Virat Kohli had Emma Stoney's team and Emma Stoney had Virat Kohli's team, then I think, you know, both of them would have different records. I think that's a very fair thing to say. I, I do think there were parts of, <clears throat> I think there were parts of Emma Stoney's test career where his pragmatism didn't help him. I remember, I mean, I covered both of the, the Australia and the England series. He basically spent eight tests moaning that they didn't have a international scene bowling all rounder. Like, yeah, get in the queue, mate. Australia haven't had one for 45 years. Um, you know, it's, you know, outside of New Zealand and, and South Africa and now England, it's not exactly like it's a common thing to get someone like that. Like India did well to have Kapil Dev. Um, and Pakistan did incredible to have Imran Khan. But it's not a normal thing to find those players. There's only like a handful of them through the history of cricket. Uh, and he kept moaning about it. And I kept thinking that's just such a, such a stupid thing to even be focusing on. <clears throat> but he was seeing that as I think the difference between those those teams. And then, you know, in Australia, obviously, uh, uh, it was uh, – still moaning about it because that's what he wanted. He wanted that extra um, option. Um, uh, I don't think he was a bad test captain. Uh, he has a different record to Virat Kohli because he has a different team to the Virat Kohli. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, most of the stuff that is said about captaincy is utter nonsense. Um, but I do think there were times where I think Dhoni preferred the formu formulaic version of cricket because he, he's, well, he's a video game player. I've said this before, like, you know, he's a video game player and he understands patterns and rhythms and test cricket quite often goes beyond that. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of endless at a certain point. And, and I think that that bothered him a little bit. Did you, did you ever think or get the impression that he was not as interested in the longer format as he was involved in the white ball formats? No, I don't think, I don't think, inter I mean, he, he generally looks disinterested in all formats of cricket, doesn't he? I mean, he's, <laughs> when have you ever looked at him and go, that's uh, you know, look at Glenn Phillips on a cricket field and look at MS Dhoni, who looks like he wants to play every single ball of cricket and who looks like he'd rather be off playing World of Warcraft. Um, that's not the game that Dhoni plays, is it? it's the other one, but whatever, whatever game it is he plays. Um, so, yeah, I mean, disinterest is a, you know, a thing. I, there's a lot of, Amateur experts out there. Do you remember Safra's, um, uh, um, it was, uh, uh, God, why have I forgotten his name? They're, they're, they're bloody, uh, Pakistani captain. Is it Safra's Ahmed? Is that who I mean? Yeah, yeah. God, he, he's, he's fallen off my memory bank. Um, do you remember he yawned once on a field in the World Cup and literally it was front page news in Pakistan? And it's just like, like we, you know, 
people try and read, you know, uh, I remember Stuart McGill was the angriest person I've ever seen when he'd taken a wicket. Um, and that's such an odd thing. And, uh, you know, whereas other players are joyful and they get looked at differently. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I, I would say that there were parts of test cricket that frustrated Aaron Stoney because he couldn't control them. He can control a lot in one day cricket and especially in T20 cricket and in test cricket, it doesn't quite work that way. And I always thought he was at his best when he could control it, whether with a really clever field or, you know, um, an interesting tactic from a bowler. I always felt that those were the bits he liked, but a lot of test cricket is kind of beyond your control. I like, I talk about this a lot, but essentially in test cricket, most of the time when you're making bowling changes, it's because someone's tired, right? It's a normal rotation. There's a flexibility within, especially T20 cricket. It's like so one day cricket, and especially T20 cricket is guys don't get tired. So if you want to use a guy for four straight overs, you kind of can. Um, and if you want to um, mix and match and, and and do all these different things, you can't really do that in Test cricket because you know Shami's just bowled a seven over spell. You, it's hard to bring him back in half an hour's time to get him to bowl another six over spell just because there's a physical limitation on what he can do. Um, and I think those sorts of things probably frustrated someone like Emma Stoney, who he, who likes to play cricket a little bit more like, you know, a, a video game or a chess player. And that's harder to do in test cricket at times just because of the natural flow of the game. Even, even simple things like, you know, it's easy to be Emma Stoney in the morning session when the ball's doing a little bit. It's harder to be Emma Stoney probably in the afternoon session when uh, he's tried drying them up in the first hour and that hasn't worked. Um, and he's sort of run out of options and he's run out of bowlers uh, I think that's a normal thing. But, yeah, most of the things that are said about captaincy are just are wrong to begin with. Um, Do you think the, the way a captain presents himself, uh, you know, like how Virat has been so vocal about Test cricket and uh, he's kind of the flag bearer and, you know, so uh, does that also help uh, in creating an image in people's mind that, okay, this is the better Test captain? Because, you know, technically, Virat won a series in Australia when Smith and Morn were not there. The other series we won under Rahane. And the England series is still not completed technically. So, I mean, he has not won in South Africa, New Zealand as well. I'm, I'm not. I, I don't... I mean, MS Dhoni isn't exactly pimping T20 cricket either. He doesn't talk. Yeah. Right? So, does... You know, but Chennai win a lot. And so... And India won a tournament under him. So, it doesn't matter, right? Um, it, it, Virat Kohli is a bigger superstar than MS Dhoni. Uh, he's more available. He's more social media savvy. Uh, he's busier. He does more things. He's in more ads, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, I can't imagine MS Dhoni in the, in the height of his prime allowing, you know, an American writer to follow him around for a couple of days like Wright Thompson did with Virat Kohli. But Virat Kohli's like, oh, I might have the cover of an ESPN magazine in America. Then I'll do that. I just don't think MS Dhoni ever worked in that particular way. Um, there's a different fandom around both of them as well. So, look, they're all fair. They're all fair points that you make. But realistically, everything that you have said would mean absolute jack shit if Emma Stoney had won the the two biggest series. That's what it comes down to. That's what people remember you for. And and what you said is completely true. And what you said is completely true that Rahane was involved with one, and the other one isn't completely finished. But if Emma Stoney had won those two biggest series, he would have completely and still beaten South Africa and New Zealand. Um, he would have been an absolute god um, and he would have been un 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 infallible and anything Verat would have done would have paled in to comparison. But there's no doubt that this team is better now under Verat Kohli than it, is, than it was under Emma Stoney. That might have nothing to do with captaincy, but it's a better team. I mean, Emma Stoney would have loved to have played with this team. He would have, you know, this would him, him going into a test match with five bowlers to begin with, uh, was what he was desperate to do and he tried to gerrymander as much as possible and it didn't work for him. Now, Jadeja has stepped up and become the player that, that Dhoni wanted him to be, um, which gives Virat Kohli even more flexibility when it comes to selecting the team. Plus, the fast bowlers are better, right? I mean, MS Dhoni had to pull Ishan Sharma limping and screaming um, and Virat Kohli got Ishan Sharma the world's best bowler. So, uh, anyway, thank you very much for your questions, mate. Have a good one. All right. Atish. Artish, you're on the air. Artish, you were almost on the, the air, moment? and now you've muted yourself. I can. What's your question? Oh, uh, hi. Uh, yeah, my question uh, is, it was about Rajasthan Royals originally, but then I realized that you made a video, and I think you probably would have covered it there. 
I probably haven't. I mean, ask away. Let's see if I covered it. Let's see how good I am. Uh, yeah, so uh, like in your previous video about the uh, captaincy equation that you made about how overseas captains can be like a like huge liability for a team, uh, does a similar thing apply for building your team entirely around overseas players as well? Because that's a strategy that they have been following since 2008. Right, there was Shane Warne, there was Shane Watson, and now it's uh, Stokes, Butler, Archer. No, and they might not send a big talent. Oh. No, I don't think I don't think that's true. I think they just haven't found any good Indian talent, <laughs> which is different. Now you could say that that is their own fault, um, and I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that. I don't think. I think. If you, if you look at the players they've had, so who did they have? They had Rahul Tripathi. Who was another, they had another big name Indian player, didn't they? Well, I think uh, right. Yeah, no, no. I'm th thinking there was another guy. What, who was that one? Uh, they had Rahane. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, no, they still have Rahane. There's another Indian player that they had that disappeared, I, I, only because I did the research yesterday. They've had some players that I would have thought, I, I, I think that what they tried to do was get a bunch of younger players in and they thought that they would create a deli like situation, but they clearly didn't draft those players correctly. Then what they did was is they tried to make the overseas players fit all the holes. And I think we can see with them and almost every team has ever tried to do that. <clears throat> it has worked on occasion. I think if you go back to the Hyderabad team, I think it's probably fair to say that they overcame it. But realistically, if you want to win consistently in T20 cricket, the local team players are so much more important. So, so much more important. When, uh, when I was with St. Lucia, that was, that was my whole thing at the end, was basically trying to make it so that, um, that we had a core of what I thought were the best four to six younger players and Kyron Pollard, and then we we're going to build around that. Um, and, and some of those players are still there, but, you know, if you look at the players that I wanted to build that core around, and these were players who were with St. Lucia at that time, Odin Smith, Chandra Vaughan Hemraj, um, they let both of those go. Look at where those players are now and what they would be able to do for St. Lucia. And if you add those to Obed McCoy, Raheem Cornwall, um, well, Cohen Pollard obviously eventually left, but that's what you were trying to do. And I was trying to sign guys like Hetmeyer, Puran, uh, Rutherford. Um, uh, who's the big one I went after from Jamaica as well? Um, Robin Powell. Those were the guys I was trying to sign. And the reason I was trying to do that was once I had that core, I knew that it might take a little bit longer to develop, but I knew the talent of those players and I knew most of them were being underpaid and I was willing to even slightly overpay some of them in order to build a core there together. I think what Rajasthan did was is they probably lost, they probably didn't hold on to the guys like Tripathi who were medium level talents. So in my case, that would be, that would have been Keswick Williams and, um, Andre Fletcher, not that either of them are not very good players, but there's there's other players out there, um, uh, that younger players who might have been able to usurp them. But in the meantime, what I would have done is I would have kept those players. We would have ha and then had hope that one or two of the younger players came along. If you look at what Rajasthan seemed to have done, it seems to have been we will go for the younger players and, we'll, and they will come off, but they don't have the mid-level players, you guys from the ages of 23 to 31 who are utilitarian, who are not, like Tripathi is a very, very decent replacement level player. So he's probably never going to average over 30. He's also probably never going to score at a particularly slow rate. He's a little bit limited in his game, but he gives it his all. And, and I think that what Rajasthan never did was match up those players with the younger players. And then the younger players weren't as good as they thought they were going to be. Uh, you know, Shivam Dubey and uh, Riyam Parag. Um, I'm sure you've got about 10 other names that you can probably add. Um, uh, Unad Kutt, who I think is a fantastic red ball bowler, but he hasn't come along in white ball cricket and he's very limited. And it means that you have to, if, you, if he's going to be one of your bowlers, you have to build around him. Um, and so I think that's where the problem of Rajasthan is, is that they they didn't keep enough of the mid-level talents around and they went for youth, 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 and none of the youth came off. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So in a way, they're like the Arsenal of IPL. They're like a lot of young players. I, I, I cannot help you with that reference.
Look, the, the thing is, the thing is also that Delhi have done incredibly well to develop a team which they may not be able to keep together because of the maker option, right? And that's also why, and that was the, that was our trouble with Solution as well. I remember, uh, you know, talking to people at Solution and going, I don't want to let Chandra Ball Hemraj go. And they're like, you can't retain a player of his level because everyone in the, in the uh, all the senior players in the league will look at you silly that you retained a player who hasn't broken through yet. And, and that's right. And if you want to look at that, Bangalore did that with um, Safaraz Khan, right? They retained a player who hadn't really broken through yet and it annoyed some senior players um, and, and you know, ended up being probably the worst possible thing that had happened uh, for that franchise. And they, you know, until this year, they hadn't really recovered from that one sort of major mistake that they made. And that's a big problem, I think, with the league. I think that if you're developing under 23 players, you should have extra right to match cards available at mega auctions for those players because that's what we want to see. We want to see, like a Denver Nuggets sort of um, uh, thing in the NBA where, you know, they've taken a punt on a bunch of younger players in one generation that will come through. Uh, the way that you see it sometimes in international cricket, um, the, same, the way you see it sometimes in county cricket. And at the moment, the, 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 the T20 sh um, structure, and it's not just the IPL, it's unfortunately right across the league, doesn't really allow for that. And so it's really hard to work out how these teams rebuild if they're bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, Mumbai is only ever going to be so bad because of the core, right? But if you don't have that core, like Rajasthan or, you know, or, or your core, you know, rots like Hyderabad, you, it's very hard in one, one auction cycle to be able to grow that perfectly unless your all your auction picks work out. And auction picks don't work out. We can't tell the future. We don't know how these players are going to develop. We don't know how someone with good smack schools are going to, you know, translate to the higher levels. So it's really, really tough. Um, but thank you so much for your question, Artish. Thanks. All right. Who we got next? Kyle. Oh. Kyle. You're on the air, Kyle. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so it's another IPL question. Uh, again, talking about it, uh, a lot of the times your analysis comes down to it's such a short season and it limits sample size. Do you think that I would think the ideal season length would be like with 14 teams, 26 games, um, enforcing, you know, uh, more rotation and, you know, get peak teams playing two days, uh, every two days instead of every three days. Do you think that could fit into the current schedule? And how do you think like an increased number of games would affect uh, T20 analysis and strategy going forward? Yeah, it would have a huge boom. Um, you know, I think the IPL will be the first league to do it. Um, I think 26 games is fine. I, you know, anything around 30 is just a huge leap forward for this sport, realistically. Uh, the amount of information that we'll be able to get. It'd be really interesting to see what teams like England and Australia do with their leagues going forward. Um, because they're trying to use it to make money, but the, and they don't want they don't want the SAG. They don't want the you know the IPL already has a SAG and the NBA has a SAG and MLB has a SAG, but they're much bigger competitions. But when the Big Bash made it a bigger tournament, that was a bit of a problem. But also, you know, we're playing one game a night at the moment, Carl, right on TV. Do you think you play like, two games? Is that what I mean? That's kind of what you would do, isn't it? If you or I were running this, <laughs> wouldn't we? Am I? Um, I think two games a day, um, whether they're both, you know, and you have head to head, or and you have Mumbai playing um, Punjab on one channel, and you have RCB playing Delhi on another, um, you know, and then you can pick which game you want. Uh, you might even, I, I don't know, but there's even a possibility, isn't there, if you got Mumbai playing one game and you've got Kolkata playing in the other game of getting even higher ratings, don't you? Um, in, you know, it wouldn't always be the case. Uh, uh, so, yeah, no, I definitely think uh, going forward uh, that would be the case. I think what happened was that the Big Bash and the IPL sort of had this one every game's an event thing, uh, which is fine, but at, we have to sort of move beyond that a little bit. Uh, it has to be a proper league and – you know, there should be multiple games played. You know, what is there? Sometimes eight, nine, ten NBA games are played on the one night. You know, football has a similar thing. 
um, that's probably where cricket has to get to. Um, you know, there should be more. Um, there should be more back-to-back -back games. So, as you said, uh, uh, you know, uh, t two games in a row, um, but playing the same opposition. So, you know, you have a you have a wing where I don't know. Uh, you go to. I'm trying to think of how this would work uh, from a logistics point of view. Uh, you go to what Mumbai for two games and what. When Pune was around, you would have played Pune for two games. Um, I'm trying to think of what the of what the uh, uh, ge geography of it of it is, but you know what I mean. Like, you know, you do maybe Hyderabad and Delhi uh, in 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 a, in a thing, and that's how um, American sports teams do it, as you know. Um, and it makes a lot more sense. We could fit more games in. We'd have a lot more information. I think it would help the sport. It wouldn't make the tournament that much longer because at the moment, part of the, as you said, part of the reason the tournament is so is is that the length it is is because we're not really maximizing how often players can play. Well, I, I did the math. You know, teams play about every three, three and a half days. You can get that down to every two games. Teams would have to rotate more. Yeah, fast bowlers. Yeah, no doubt. Fast bowlers would rotate more. Uh, we'd go to a platoon type situation, like baseball would be my guess, um, uh, which which is fine. Uh, which is kind of what we have to, we should be doing anyway because we're playing so many uh, different players. But yeah, I, I don't I don't see any reason why we can't do that. Um, there would be more rest and rotation um, uh, involved in that. But also, to be fair, Carl, once we get to like fourteen teams, we could also have a slightly longer season. It doesn't have to be as short as it as it currently is. Um, so there are other ways of doing that. But yeah, I think um, things. I say it all the time. And people involved in these leagues sometimes get upset, but they're pop-up leagues, right? It's not a real league. It's like an event that happens and then it disappears. And we want it to be a proper league. We want it to be played properly. Um, uh, otherwise, it will never it will never be able to grow. If we keep treating every game like it's so super special, that's not it's not fucking super special when can I play Punjab on a Tuesday night? That's not special, Kyle. You and I know that. There are games that are special and there are games that are not special. And I may not want to watch can I you know, Punjab, I might want to watch RR Mumbai and um, uh, and I don't have the, that, you know, uh, available to me. So I, I think that's where we're limiting ourselves. This is where the cricket side of things sometimes. It's just like sometimes we just have to go, if this is a proper sport and we believe it's a proper sport and, geez, if the IPL itself hasn't proved that at this stage, I don't know what will, then it has to be run like a proper sport. And at the moment it's still not. It's run like a... Well, I mean, the Big Bash was very honest to me when I talked to the guy who ran the Big Bash, Anthony Everard, and he said, oh, we run it more like a pop concert than we do a um, cricket tournament, which is, you know, Adelaide have a few games in a row and the, and the, 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 the crew all travel there and then the crew all travel here and then the crew all travel. That's not, that's not where we need to be, I don't think, really, as, as a sport. Um, and it probably worked for the first part of uh, T20 cricket, but it's kind of a bit silly going forward. Wait. I think we can fit more games in. I think we can fit more teams in. I think we can have stronger leagues um, because of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, salary cap would go up. You'd probably, you'd probably have more players, especially if you need the more fast bowlers. You'd probably have more players in your squad, especially overseas in, in the case of, you know, a league like the IPL. Um, you know, Pakistan Super League would probably be a similar one, maybe CPL. Um, but yeah, you know, those are the... Those are the things that have to happen if you want to develop the sport. Um, and sometimes I wonder, you know, they're trying to milk as much money per game out of it as possible. And I'm like, I think there are better ways to be able to do this, to make it more like a real sport, to give us more options as fans. And, you know, some, some of the, the coverage of the T20 leagues, I, I talked about this recently on Twitter, you can't find out who's injured because the teams don't release the, thing and the league isn't involved in it there's no they've not they've not encouraged in any t20 league in the world proper coverage of their own sport and that's partly because they treat them more like rock concerts coming to town one night only rather than a daily sport right and if it's a daily sport and your team's playing over and over again or a weekly sport what you know whatever it is and whatever kind of league you play in um the coverage is way different and i think that at the moment short seasons and and everything else around them is just a it's holding the sport back um and uh we should be playing more games with more teams and uh moving forward
Uh, but yeah, thanks for your question, mate. All right, probably only have time for two more. Akila? Akilia, who has a London bus in his profile. <gasps> oh, oh, there he is. London bus. How are we doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's in Sri Lanka. But, uh... Is it a Sri Lankan bus? Yeah, they, they used to have them until the, the 1980s. But it is, a, but it's the London style, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's the same with company. Oh, beautiful. I didn't know you had them in Sri Lanka. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I remember when Colombo got very, I, I know this has nothing to do with it, but I'm going to bring it up anyway because it's you and I chatting. But I remember when Colombo suddenly in around, what, 2011, 12, got the most modern buses I'd seen anywhere. Um, and I was like, this is, th this is awesome. Um, and I started traveling by bus for a little while. I don't know if they still have those, but they were very good. Anyway, continue. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering what are some test series of the past that don't get much coverage that you would recommend viewers to, to go and watch back? Well, the biggest problem is finding the footage of the really good ones. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there's obviously a very good one in the early 1900s for three Australia and England, but you may not, may not be able to get that. Um, I really think that going back the England Sri Lanka series of was it twenty twelve? I want to say twenty thirteen, whatever it was. Uh, when Sri Lanka twenty fourteen was it? Yep. When Sri Lanka held on for a draw was an absolute ripper. Um, Pakistan West Indies when, when uh, the why did he do that series? Um, uh, I always thought that was that was quite a fun, entertaining um, series. Uh, God, there's hundreds of South African series um, over the last couple of years because it's been impossible to bat there and people have been getting hit all the time and some, you know, sort of random results. Um, obviously, there's, you know, Sri Lanka winning that test over there. Um, uh, you know, there's certainly been some uh, good moments there. I don't think of anything else. Um Yeah, those are the ones that come to me off, over the last few years that we probably would have more footage of. Um, the biggest problem is, yeah, the, the finding of the footage and, and how to go back. And, and also, if they're not involving one of the three major nations, they're just not covered properly. So it's very hard to go back and sort of re-piece them in your mind. Um, you know, it's something that we find a lot on Double Century and talk to someone like Abhish Abhishek Mukherjee and we... We spend most of our time just moaning that we can't find any information about these great series. And you go back and, look, and you look at the games and you start, well, this looks like a cracker. And there's like a wisdom report saying, and England didn't do very well in this particular series. And you say, I think it's a bit more than that. Um, so, yeah, I think um, uh, those are the ones that come, uh, that come to me off the top of my head. There's so much cricket played now that it's, oh, what about, did, I've got a feeling, was there not a really good New Zealand-Pakistan series? In the UAE, I feel like there was one there as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because there are so many different cricket series in my head at any one time uh, that I find it hard to actually uh, follow that um, at all. But uh, but yeah, those are some of the ones off the top of my head that that are quite good. But I'm sure that um, some some there might be some other fans who who are better for me. There's so much cricket being played at any one time that. Um, I generally probably remember individual performances better or patterns better than I do series. Um, so I probably haven't answered that very well for you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. I, I was just going to say, any from like the early to, to 2000s, as there, there is a decent amount of footage for that. Um, early 2000s. No. Wasn't there a good England, South Africa series around that time? Um, uh, from memory. Um, uh, obviously there was a couple of Australia India series, but they're quite well known. Um, there was a very interesting Australia New Zealand series from, <coughs> sorry, uh, from 2000, wasn't there? Was it 99? I'm trying to remember the year, um, when New Zealand, uh, really pushed Australia in Australia quite dramatically. I think there's a lot of, actually, there was a, quite a lot of very good England series, maybe between 2001 and what, 2005. Um, uh, and there's probably, was there not, I'm trying to think, was there not a good series around when Chaminda Vass ripped up England in Sri Lanka 
Is that not a decent series or did Sri Lanka get away with that one? I know they did in that particular test. Um, but yeah, they do kind of blur in after a while. I, I don't think that that was as it, uh, like, I think this era of test cricket is much more exciting than anything in the 2000s. Um, I think people play cricket, test cricket in a better way. I think there's more wickets. Um, uh, there's more of it um, being played. But but yeah, um, hopefully I've stumbled across one or two hidden gems in there. Um, the Australia and New Zealand one was a really interesting one. I do remember that. In fact, most of the Australian South African ones probably don't get as much um, uh, time uh, because they're not in ashes and India are uninvolved. Really, really interesting from what, 94, really, onwards. Um, uh, Australia, South Africa were really two really interesting teams. Um, and there's probably a few forgotten Sri Lankan series, I would think, between what, 90. Eight um, and what, two thousand and five, two thousand and six. Um, that I'm probably forgetting as well. Like some, maybe some Australia New Zealand series. Um, the one I really like to go back on and see, uh, which is must be the eighties, maybe the early nineties, was the series that Aravinda de Silva um, scored a lot of runs on green tops in New Zealand, which New Zealand is still talk about. Um, uh, I can't remember how close the series was, but I know Aravinda's. Uh, was remembered as just a genius um, in those. So I'd love to, love to have gone back and seen some of those. Also, you know, uh, in Pakistan in the in the eighties. I'd love to see because West Indies sort of sucked all the air out of the room, um, quite rightly. But Pakistan were as good as them at times, um, and were an incredible team. And you know, uh, maybe especially you know some of the early eighties stuff against India um, is a little bit more well known. But I'd love to know what they sort of did um, in some of the other series as well. Um, and just Pakistan, West Indies, all the way through the 80s. The first time we, the, the, the best team in the world wasn't from, you know, the, the best teams in the world weren't from Australia, England or South Africa. Um, and they were fighting each other. Um, I'd love to go back. And they just weren't very well covered, um, unfortunately. But yeah, there you go. Thanks, mate. Thanks. All right. Kelsa, last question. Bring it home. Uh oh. Oh, else is gone. We tried. Good. Oh, who's on the line? Yeah. Yep. What's your name? Kalsa. Oh, it's Kalsa. Oh, beautiful. Oh, excellent. All right. Don't ask your question, sir. <laughs> uh, my question is for you that uh, we will see Mushfiq and Sakib really good as a pair in T20 cricket. I have uh, uh, seen the performance, their performance, uh, when they play uh, in a team in T20 cricket. You know, Mushfiq has got five international T20 50, and maybe average, uh, maybe average 30 and uh, strike rate of 135 when he plays uh, without Shakib in the team. Shakib doesn't play if Shakib is not playing for Bangla. But whenever Mushfiq uh, playing, when Shakib is in the team, his average is slow, you know, drags down to 10, and maybe in strike rates comes down to uh, 100, uh, you know, less than 100. And Did you change? Yes, Mushfiq uh, is always... Yeah, uh, sorry, just let me uh, butt in. Sorry, Matt Kalsa, but does he change where he bats in the order when, when Shakib's playing? No, I think uh, Shakib bats at number three and Mushfiq gen generally bats at four. But when Shakib is not in the team, uh, Mushfiq always bat at number four. Still plays at number four. Yeah. yeah. Then, then, then I wouldn't worry about. Yep. Sorry, just let just let me uh, jump in. You can you can answer this after, but then I wouldn't think there would be any impact at all of the two of them playing together, unless he's changing where he bats in the batting order. It's probably just dumb luck that when he's played in those games, he hasn't been as good. I can't imagine there would be anything at all that would would be you know that would uh, would change him, unless you know unless literally Shakib is running him out. That would be the only difference. Shakib is not running him out, but it is not for Shakib. You know, Mushfiq is Mushfiq plays in the team, and you know, Shakib is still getting runs. But whenever Shakib is in the team, or maybe Shakib is getting out inside of ten runs, 
Ushwig is getting scores and he, both of them can't really score uh, at a time. Most of the time Shakib can score, but Ushwig can. But Ushwig always can perform whenever Shakib is one, not playing at the, or maybe getting out inside, you know, 10 runs. But that's, it's just not, no, it's just, it's, it's just dumb luck, mate. There's, there's no, there's no pattern in, in what you're looking at there, right? Because if, if there was a pattern, it would if, if they literally changed his role in the team and he started batting in a different position, that would be, that would be a pattern. Um, you know, it's just that it, ha, how many T20 games has he, have these guys played together? Now, maybe 90 matches and without yeah, maybe 15 matches. I find uh, approximately maybe 70 or, and without Shakib, most week had played maybe 15 or 20. And in those 15 or 20, he has worked excellent back. That's the, that's the uh, Okay. Well, I mean, I, I'd be absolutely shocked. Let's have a look. Mushfika Rahim has played 91 matches. He's got an average of 19.7 and a strike rate of 115 in, in T20 internationals. Yeah, that's who we're talking about? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's already a poor record no matter who he plays with, right? Um, uh, His record really... Looks great, excellent when he when, when Shakib is not playing, uh, or Shakib is getting out inside ten or you know ten or twelve runs. But why would that make any difference? Is my question to you. Well, like, it, it, let's say, let's say you're right and you've noticed this pattern, right? And I do, I would have to go through the numbers to work it out. Why on earth would that make any difference to him? He's still facing the same bowlers. They're still bowling the same deliveries, right? What has changed? The person at the other end. Unless Shakib's actually shooting, you know, um, a, a BB gun at his eyes, right? What on earth could Shakib do that would put him off? I'm not like, I'm really saying done. that Shakib is the main culprit. No, 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 no I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not blaming Shakib. My point is, what could Shakib being on the field do that would change him? I, I don't understand what it could be about his presence that would do that other than dumb luck. But uh, the record or the stats telling it, you know, that I'm I'm right or and no 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 the, the stats aren't telling you both of them don't yeah. play. Okay, the stats aren't telling you that you're right. Yeah, the stats aren't telling you that they're right. You're right. The stats are showing you a random correlation between something, and and you are bringing it to our attention, which is more than fine. But it might also mean nothing. Those same stats, right? Because you would have to first come to the conclusion that those two batting together is bad for that to mean anything, right? And that I can't think of any particular reason why those two batting together would be bad, right? Now, if you come up with one, maybe it's some random thing about matchups or, um, you know, um, I think what else, what else it could be. Yeah, so. So what kind of bowler is um, uh, uh, Mushfika bad against that Shakib is also bad against? And so teams are bowling the same kind of bowler twice to them. That's the only thing that it could be. And I'd find that pretty doubtful um, if, if we're being honest. So let's just have a look here. See if I can bring this up while we're on air. Why not? Let's do it. Let's try, Kausa. If it's not you and I, who can do this? All right. All for Bangladesh. Shakib Al Hassan, thank you. Batting. All right. Okay. Well, he averages, I mean, he averages 15 in the games that Shakib plays in, and he averages about 24 in the, in the games that he doesn't play in. All right? He's not a good T20 player either way. And he's played 72 games with Shakib in the, to in the team and, and uh, 19 games without him. Um, I would say that over those 72 games, it would be very hard to blame, a, a, you know, a combination of him being with the player at the other end. Um, and, and you said before that when Shakib is going to go out early in a lot of those games as well. It's not like they're always going to be batting together. Um, so I think that deep down, he's not a very good T20 player. I think that's maybe the most 
you know, the most obvious thing about his career. I'd be shocked if there's a big impact on Shaqib because I just don't think they would have had that many partnerships in those 71 games. Most of those times he would have failed. He would have failed because he failed. Um, and, yeah. The interesting part is both of them really is a good partner, are good partners in ODA cricket and test cricket. Why aren't they good in cricket? Are they playing in the it, same role? No. It's a different sport to begin with, a different form of the sport. But also, Mushfika isn't as good a player in this format. Right? So, in Test cricket, he averages 37. In ODI cricket, he averages 37. And in international T20s, of which he's played almost 100, he averages 19. He's not good at it because he doesn't have a fifth gear to be able to score at the rate. So, when he tries to score quickly, he goes out. And when he doesn't try and score quickly, he scores really slow. He's got a career strike rate of 115. This isn't a Shakib issue. This is a him issue. There's something wrong with his T20 batting. He doesn't, you know, even if you look at him domestically, um, uh, he's averaging 29 with a strike rate of 126. He's not an above average domestic T20 player, let alone an international T20 player. So um, that's what the problem is here. Anyway, thank you very much for that question. And thank you to everyone. Uh, remember, oops, sorry, cut him off. Uh, thanks everyone who asked questions again on Spotify Green Room. Remember, you can follow me. I'm at Jared Kimber. Come to Spotify Green Room. We usually put these up. Uh, we usually say that we're doing them on Instagram and on Twitter, um, but they're sometime on Fridays between 9:30 British Standard Time and 12:30 British Standard Time usually, or 1:30 British Standard Time. Um, uh, thank you again to Manscaped, who will help you shave your balls safely. Cannot be any clearer on that. Lawn Mower 4.0. Uh, use the code REDINCA at manscaped.com for a 20% discount, free worldwide shipping. Uh, thanks again to Bodyline T-shirts. And thanks to everyone on Patreon. I mean, this podcast really only exists because of the support that we get on Patreon. Um, and usually I remember to read the Patreon questions out but or ask for them. In this case, I didn't. So sorry again to everyone on Patreon. But thank you for your support. Um, on Patreon, you can get all sorts of things. You get uh, private AMAs. Uh, we do, I do video chats with some people on some of the benefits. Uh, you get ad-free podcasts and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, thank you to everyone um, for coming and tuning in. A uh, really good show, and I'll talk to you again sometime soon.